controversy surrounding the Ontario government's appointment of Toronto Police Superintendent Ron Tavener to the position of OPP Commissioner. That appointment has now been delayed at the request of Tavener himself. This after growing criticism over how he got the job and questions over how much Premier Doug Ford had to do with it. CBC's Lorenda Redekop has the latest. Ron Tavener is now calling for the Integrity Commissioner to review his own hiring as OPP Commissioner. He's a close friend of Doug Ford's, whose hiring has raised questions about whether the Premier intervened. The Tavener's email to the Minister of Community Safety reads, interest. Out of the greatest of respect for the brave men and women of the Ontario Provincial Police, I am requesting my appointment as Commissioner be postponed until as such time the Integrity Commissioner has completed his review. The minister, Sylvia Jones, responded in a statement saying, while the government has full confidence in Mr. Tavener, we will respect his request for a delay in his appointment until such time as the integrity commissioner has conducted a review of the selection process. Tavener was most recently a Toronto Police Superintendent, two ranks below the requirement in the initial job posting. The posting was later changed, allowing him to apply. The Premier denies any involvement. I had zero influence, and no matter who it was, I would have accepted. One of Tavener's former bosses was on the three-person hiring team. Today, the opposition called for a more extensive review. We are calling for an emergency select committee uh, to be struck uh, that would consist of members of both the government as well as um, other members of uh, the legislature here, uh, MPPs. Interim OPP Commissioner Brad Blair would be in favour of that, says his lawyer. I'm sure that my client, uh, the interim commissioner, would be uh, extremely interested in seeing what is needed is something robust uh, and effective and credible. Blair will be out as interim commissioner on Monday. He also applied for the commissioner job and has questioned the process, first calling for an ombudsman investigation, which was denied, then going to the courts to try to force one. His lawyer says this isn't about his client trying to get ahead. He chose, with frankly serious professional risk to him, he chose to uh, insist on this being looked at. OPP Deputy Commissioner Gary Couture will now temporarily take on the commissioner role. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. The man charged in the death of Thunder Bay teen Brayden Jacob made his first court appearance today. 22-year-old Jonathan Yellowhead of EBM Tong was arrested Friday. He's charged with second-degree murder and breach of probation. Jacob was reported missing last Thursday. His body was found in Chapels Park three days later. He was from Waybique First Nation and was in Thunder Bay to receive counseling services not available in his community. Jacob's death comes at a time of intense scrutiny on Thunder Bay police and their treatment of the city's indigenous population. Dozens of Parkdale residents held a protest today against the eviction of Parkdale Community Legal Services. The clinic has been providing aid for decades and is supposed to move out of its location sometime in the new year. CBC's Natalie Nanowski has the details. Who's got the power? We've got the power! What kind of power? Parkdale power! These Parkdale residents say their legal clinic has given them the tools to fight for themselves when landlords have tried to push them out. They've empowered myself as well as other members of the community to really stand on their own feet and not feel like they'd be bullied by big conglomerates. Community members say the clinic is now dealing with its own eviction. In October, it was notified that in the new year, it's going to have to move locations as the building will be undergoing renovations. But workers say moving the services would hurt Parkdale. Marginalized people are, are so dependent on our, our services and the thought of not having us there in the community um, to be a place where they can go and access um, when they need us was, was, I think, very, very difficult news to take in. So dozens of people took their frustrations to the annex to protest outside the landlord's home. We want Marty to sit down with Parkdale Legal and negotiate in good faith and uh, keep Parkdale Legal 
illegal in the community at least until June. We reached out to the landlord who told us that he was upset by the protest. Both sides wouldn't tell us the terms of the eviction or lease, but the landlord did explain that talks are underway. Not locking them out right now. There's no lockout. They, I told her that. I've already said to her, we will not lock you out. We will try and work this out. The landlord also told us that he's willing to sit down with the legal clinic as early as Monday and negotiate a term that's fair for both sides. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. The Daily Bread Food Bank opened its newest location in Scarborough yesterday to address the growing need in the community. I'm just uh, amazed uh, at this, you know, um, how much there is and um, uh, the people that I'm working with are great people. The VP and Shepherd Food Bank is located on the first floor of a Toronto community housing building near Victoria Park Avenue and Shepherd Avenue. The Daily Bread Food Bank says there has been an 86% increase in the use of food banks in Scarborough in the last decade, largely due to the lack of affordable housing in the area. A lot of people who live in um, different parts of the city are moving to, uh, to Scarborough because of uh, the housing prices, um, the rent. Uh, but uh, even in Scarborough now, rent is increasing. So uh, there is more and more need for, uh, for food banks uh, because people need to uh, juggle between uh, putting food on the table, paying for TTC, whatever they need to uh, sustain themselves. The new food bank is run by volunteers, some of whom live in the same building as the food bank. It is open every Friday between 4 and 6 p.m. And just a reminder, our Sounds of the Season charity drive in support of local food banks continues until the end of the year. We're collecting money and non-perishable food do donations, and you can donate in person right here at CBC Broadcasting Centre or online at cbc.ca slash SOTS. And as the holiday season gets underway, the many food drives and initiatives across the city, including CBC Sounds of the Season, are a reminder to give back to the less fortunate in our community. And as Adrian Chung reports, a group of volunteers is looking out for residents all year long. Anybody need some jackets? The holidays at Seton House, one of Toronto's largest shelters, isn't always the easiest of times. But once a month, that changes. We're just a bunch of friends trying to make a difference. Yeah, well, you guys are. Thank Thanks. you. The group is pounding the pavement and making connections in East End neighborhoods. It was founded by Peel Regional Police Officer Kimberly Catarat. Off duty, she spearheads a team of 50 volunteers giving back. I love it. Like I, I can't even express like the smiles that they, we put on people's faces and knowing that we're giving back to the community. From Moss Park to Cabbage Town, they're giving clothes, toothbrushes, and food to those who need it most. I, I'm fortunate enough to have a few things, so I grabbed a coat and some food, uh, some hygiene products. But it's really cool when they come on. This is the stuff that the streets need. We don't need pipes. The group is doubling their efforts this holiday season, but their donation drive runs all year long, and it's not the spotlight that they're after, calling themselves Team Nobodies. The name Team Nobodies is from people on the street because every month we would come out and they're like, who are you guys? And we're like, we're just a bunch of nobodies trying to make a difference. Stop number two in Moss Park. The team of Nobodies works with local businesses and neighborhood officers who work the beat every day. How's the need changed, you think, on the street? Well, I've been working in Moss Park for just over two years, and one of the things I've noticed is that the homeless numbers are increasing. Um, our respite uh, bed numbers are increasing. The city's been putting more beds out. The team will be back in the new year. They say while their work helps, a good deed can come from anyone. Hand a pair of gloves, hand a hat, a scarf, anything. It doesn't take much, you know. So really, team of nobodies could be anybody. Anybody, anybody can be a nobody. That could make all the difference this holiday season. Adrian Chung, CBC News, Toronto. Great community spirit being shown there, Amanda. I love it, Maribel. Mm -hmm.
Happy to be back here with you. Let's yeah, talk about great the, to have you. <laughs> let's talk about the condition, shall we? Saturday overnight, we've got some foggy conditions. You may have noticed today it was a little bit misty, a little bit cloudy. That's because we had a system kind of tracking lower than the lake. Zero degrees feels like minus five, though. So that northeasterly flow putting in some work there, making it feel a little colder than it actually is outside. Now there's that low pressure system that's been scraping by the lower lakes, moving its way into the Atlantic. It's actually going to pack quite a punch out there not as much for us more of that cloud cover that's going to continue even into the weekend and as you can tell there's that northeasterly flow too but what we are seeing is not a lot which means that there's not a lot on the way in terms of weather conditions and it's not even too gusty along the shores of the lakes you may amplify up and over that 30 kilometer per hour range and then into the week we will see a cold front slice on through that's going to bring your temperatures down just slightly later into the week, but we're not really going to be talking about this stuff. Look at this. This is a snowfall update. We are right on track, Toronto. So good job. A plus job across the country. We're not exactly seeing right on track levels of snow as Sudbury. Well, we definitely got a lot there this evening. Our conditions continue to be foggy and we will continue to see Monday morning. But when we come back with you, Maribel, I want to talk through a couple of the events the season has to offer with Ooh. these conditions on the way. Yes, it's time to talk about that. So we'll <laughs> see you in a bit. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks. The province is facing backlash over cuts to Ontario's Indigenous Culture Fund. It was set up a year ago in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. The province was supposed to commit $5 million annually, but now the provincial government says they will be slashing the grants and putting the fund under review. I feel that if this fund is cut, it feels like an attack on reconciliation and also on Indigenous cultures. You know, we have just begun to recognize how important it is to support language and revitalization efforts. If it goes away, it says that this government is not going to fulfill its TRC obligations. It doesn't care about our TRC obligations. And, you know, I don't think that this is the kind of Ontario that most people want to live in. Well, it is the holiday season when people often travel, eat a lot, and buy gifts. Those activities can all add up. CBC's John Northcott hit the streets to see how people are feeling about their holiday finances so far. Do you have a, a budget that you are trying to stick to? Um, not officially. You don't say I'm sticking to 500 or 700 in terms of my total holiday spending? No. No, I actually calculate that at the end. We're asking people this year at Christmas if you are a Santa or a Scrooge with your gift giving. Um, probably something in the middle. <laughs> We're people of balance and moderation. Um, what, what would you say? Um, I'm, 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 I think I'm more of a Santa than a Scrooge. It's easy to get caught up in this consumer kind of spiral, right? And it should be about more than that. So we've tried to make it about more than that for, uh, for our son and, uh, you know, make, make the world a little better place at Christmas, right? Coming up, the staff turnover at the White House continues with President Donald Trump announcing the departure of yet another cabinet member. We will have the latest after the break.
The revolving door at the White House spun again today as U.S. President Donald Trump announced the departure of another cabinet member. And this comes on the same day video surfaced of his next chief of staff saying unflattering things about him. Stephen D'Souza has the latest from New York. Secretary of the Interior Ryan Zinke is the latest departure from Donald Trump's cabinet. The subject of more than a dozen ethics investigations, administration officials had reportedly been seeking his resignation for weeks. From questions about travel expenses and allegations of conflicts of interest, to his willingness to open public lands to oil and gas exploration, his departure was welcomed by environmentalists and the Democratic Party. Democrat Senate leader Chuck Schumer called Zinke a toxic member of Trump's cabinet, who treated government like his personal honeypot. The swamp cabinet would be a little less foul without him. In a statement today, Zinke called the allegations against him false. Still, he is the fourth cabinet secretary to resign in less than two years. A New York Times analysis found Trump has had more turnover in top White House and cabinet positions in his first 14 months than the last three presidents combined. To me, it's very troublesome. You have an administration that doesn't seem to be able to, to hold on to good people. General Kelly, 40-year general, Marine, whose son made the ultimate sacrifice to this country. This is not good. It's not good for the country to have this kind of instability in our federal government. Experts say Trump often makes things worse by replacing from within. Take his replacement for John Kelly as chief of staff, budget chief Mick Mulvaney. He'll reportedly keep that job while working at the White House. Although this recently unearthed clip from 2016 may shorten his tenure. Yes, I'm supporting Donald Trump. I'm doing so as enthusiastically as I can, given the fact that I think he's a terrible human being. Uh, but the choice on the other side is just as bad. Mulvaney is listed as acting chief of staff, meaning more changes are likely to come. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Nearly 200 nations have agreed on rules to implement the Paris Climate Agreement. After two weeks of talks, delegates reached a consensus at a meeting in Poland today, and Canada's Environment Minister is taking some of the credit. Austin Grabish reports. It is so decided. A deal years in the making after leaders from almost 200 different countries reached an agreement in Poland to tackle climate change. Their decisions will impact generations to come, a point this young Canadian delegate understands. We were growing up right now um, knowing that we're going to live long enough to see the consequences of whatever decision is made here in Katowice. Canada was under immense pressure to be a leader at the COP24 conference. Countries came here to implement the goals from the Paris Climate Change Accord. But critics accuse the United States of making these talks difficult. The United States will withdraw from the Paris. Especially after U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement altogether. The U.S. before would play a very prominent role publicly. Uh, that obviously is not happening because the U.S. has made its decision about how it's approaching climate. Um, unfortunately, stepping back. But other countries have stepped up, and I'd like to think Canada is one of those countries. The rules that will come out of the summit will decide how carbon markets will work. They also lay out how countries will go about reporting on their own emission cuts as nations try to prevent the world from getting warmer. Robert Parsons is an energy expert. Even with the deal, he isn't confident anything will change after the summit. I think my reaction, you know, big deal. Big deal, because you look at this and, and it's like climate change conferences are like the, the never end arrangement. They just go on and on and on. Parsons says if Canada is serious about climate change, it needs to do less talking and more work. He doesn't think the country will meet its commitment to bring greenhouse gas emissions down by 30 percent by 2030. Liam Orm thinks Canada's young people might just be the answer. There, there is still hope and I think uh, you know, in the coming months, in the coming years, we're going to need to cling to that. We're going to need to uh, to embrace it, to to acknowledge it, and to try and uh, orient our action around, uh, you know, just you know, pushing that door open a little bit further and, and getting through it. Otherwise, we're we're really, uh, you know, we're lost. But the clock is ticking when it comes to global warming, and some scientists fear the work at this conference won't be enough. Austin Grabish, CBC News, Winnipeg. We want to just have a little bit of a reverence, a little bit of fun, especially during the holiday season. Santa's 
in Speedos. Surprised some passers-by in downtown Toronto today. We'll tell you why after the break. A group of Santas raced through the streets of Toronto today wearing only their swimsuits. It was a fun run for a good cause. Have a look. We are here raising money uh, through a fun run through the streets of Yorkville for the Toys and Games Fund at the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children. We'll be raising approximately $30,000 this year, which will bring the grand total for the lifetime of this event up to a roughly $380,000 for the Toys and Games Fund. We wanted to do a fun run. Uh, there's a lot of people here. This is the only running we'll do during the year, but there's some other people who are coming off a long athletic season, and we want to just have a little bit of a reverence, a little bit of fun, especially during the holiday season, that also went to a really good cause. And Sick Kids is there's no better cause in my books. Those are some hearty and brave folks doing that, Amanda. <laughs> I love it. Okay, Maribel, I have a question for you. Okay. If Toronto's forecast was a Christmas song, what song would it be? Walking in a winter wonderland? 
Oh, it's without not. the snow? <laughs> yeah, without the snow. So maybe yours is actually dreaming of a white Christmas. There I'm we go. I'm thinking it's silent night because it is very Ooh. calm. Okay, so let's get into it. Four degrees this afternoon. Great conditions for that run today. And that means actually on the docket, we have some great conditions coming up for the following events. We're going to talk about Sunday evening, one degree southwesterly flow. And there's a lot going on downtown Toronto. Toronto Christmas Market is on. Closed on Mondays, though. $6 on the weekend, free during the week. We've got Nutcracker Christmas, Casaloma, Ontario places a lot going on in terms of skating. And if you're not one for the cold, there's a lot of events inside too. It is calm. So this is where my silent night analogy is coming from because high pressure in place. We've got this cold front extending from the north. That's going to bring our temperatures down just a touch into the week. And then high pressure really fills on in. But having a bore, boring forecast isn't too bad. Normally this time of year, the temperatures are around plus one to minus six. So we're really around there, if not above seasonal. And look, there's our dip Tuesday. So Monday into Tuesday as that cold front really scrapes on by. And what we're looking at across the country, actually, interestingly enough, is we're actually all trending a little bit above seasonal. So as Canadians, we're feeling pretty good about this. In terms of the Atlantic, the only place is uh, out in Newfoundland where we're actually going to trend below seasonal. But again, our seven day forecast in for Toronto and the GTA, we are going to be looking pretty good. So if you are heading out on the roads, just keep in mind you want to have those snow tires on if we are around that seven degree temperature, which we are already below that and just drive safely, even though conditions are looking very nice and clear for us, Maribel. Silent night, quiet weather. That's all right. I'll take it. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. No problem. Well, this next story is about a theft, but with a happy ending. That's Newfoundland senior Edward Shepard strumming the guitar he got as a gift from his late wife. A simple pleasure that ended when an intruder stole it from his house. The crime left Edward heartbroken, but a smile yeah. soon back on his face, put there by Newfoundland singing and acting celeb Alan Doyle. The story of the stolen stringed instrument tugged at Doyle's heartstrings, so much so he sent Edward a guitar he used while playing in the band Great Big C. In a note inside the case, Doyle quipped the guitar still had a few songs left in it. As you can see, Edward is loving the gift. An early Christmas present, you could say, that has definitely struck the right chord. So great. And that's our show for you tonight. Thanks for watching. You can stay caught up on news anytime on our website, cbcnews.ca. Have a great night, everyone.